Right, so in this video, we're gonna cover the basics of energy system training, get into some of the science, and talk about why everything you know about energy system training might be wrong. Right, so before we get into energy system training, I want to quickly start out with a brief discussion of what are energy systems and why do we actually want to train them. So when we're talking about energy system training, what we're really talking about is bioenergetics, and that's the stimulation of all of the metabolic processes in our body that result in energy supply and energy utilization during exercise. So the study of bioenergetics is the study of energy system training. So one of the things that we always need to keep in mind with energy systems is that contrary to popular belief, energy systems don't create energy. Energy can't be created or destroyed. So what energy systems do is transfer energy from one state to another, both inside and outside of the body. So at the simplest level, the food that we eat is a source of electrons and we breathe in oxygen. Those electrons and oxygen are gonna meet inside of the mitochondria and transform free energy into a form we could use in our body. So the better our energy system capacity, the better we could transform free energy into a usable form, which is restocking ATP in the body. The secondary function of energy systems is to offload hydrogen. Hydrogen is a byproduct of hydrolyzing or splitting apart ATP to release energy, and the different energy systems are going to deal with the outcomes of that, one being to rid our bodies of the excess hydrogen and the other being to put those ATP molecules back together again. So that pretty much covers why we want to train energy systems from a micro view. But that's not that practical of a definition. If one of my athletes comes to me and they're like, hey coach, why are we doing energy system training? I'm not going to tell them like, oh, you're producing hydrogen in your body and we need to offload that at a fast rate. They're going to stare at you like, dude, what are you talking about? So we need to make it practical from a macro perspective. So from that standpoint, what we would tell athletes is that we want to improve our energy system capacity in order to tolerate more training volume, recover from training, and improve the power and endurance of our energy systems. So the next two slides are going to get pretty technical. So if you don't completely understand these the first time through, it's not an issue. Keep watching the video and we'll kind of come back around and make these concepts more practical. And for the coaches who are interested in the science, we'll start to get into some of that in these next two slides. Right, so first we'll start with this classic model of energy system training. So a lot of times in discussions about energy systems, Coaches and people make these hard distinctions between two models of energy production. We have anaerobic and we have aerobic on the other hand. And if we're looking at this model on the left here, I'm gonna quickly draw on this. They could split it right down the center and they'll say this is anaerobic and this is aerobic. The former, anaerobic, they break down into the phosphagen and glycolytic pathways, which they say occur in the absence of oxygen, and we'll get into why that's not necessarily the case. And the latter is categorized as the oxidative system, meaning oxygen is needed for its function. So this model proposes that these aerobic and these anaerobic processes are going to occur independent of one another, and that's to say at any given point we're either operating aerobically or we're operating anaerobically. But the issue is that there's a lot of flaws with these frameworks. So many of you are probably familiar with this chart on the left. You see it in pretty much every coaching course you take and a lot of coaching textbooks and manuals. And if you've ever taken any formal exercise science training, you've definitely seen this image. And when we look at this model, there's some good things about it. So for example, if we look at the sub two seconds, it shows that ATP stores are the primary source of energy but it acknowledges that all these processes are overlapping in time. You see there's a phosphagen system contribution, glycolytic system, oxidative system, everything is kind of coupled to an extent. But once you blow past two seconds, now it's starting to get a little bit more reductive. It's just phosphagen, glycolytic, and oxidative. Apparently ATP stores got left out and those don't do anything past two seconds. Then past that 10 seconds, it's just glycolytic and oxidative, and then past two minutes, it claims that we're only using the oxidative system. So the issue is that this model isn't in agreement with most of the contemporary scientific literature. And I'm not talking about fringe concepts and studies that have come out in the past one to two years. We're talking about a solid 20 to 25 years of scientific research. So in that conventional view, they say PCR or phosphocreatine supplies almost all of the energy needed for sustained bursts of contraction lasting under 10 seconds. Then after it's replaced by glycogenolysis or it's replaced by the glycolytic system. 
but that's not actually supported in the scientific literature. So, for example, in Chungadal's paper titled Metabolic Fluctuation During a Muscle Contraction Cycle, we see that phosphocreatine consumption is about 40 times greater than values previously reported. And you'd think, like, if this is the case, why didn't scientists realize this 40, 50 years ago? And the thing is, most of what we know in science is just a product of what we're capable of measuring. So previously, when things like this model on the left were created, they used what's called a freeze clamp measurement. And the time resolution on that type of measurement is about 100 milliseconds, which seems really fast. But if we're talking about these cellular processes, that's really slow. And Chung et al. developed a technique that works on the time frame of about 2 to 8 milliseconds. So his technique is so much faster that you're able to observe things that no one ever could have imagined. And it raises the question, if that's the case, why do people still use this model on the left? And I think that's partly because that was the model that was initially proposed, and it's a case of what we would call like path dependence. If I look at my keyboard right now, we have this nice little QWERTY keyboard layout. And if you've never really looked into the history of this, you'd probably think, oh, this is a pretty efficient way to lay out a keyboard. Why else would it look like this? The thing is, this is just about the dumbest way that you could lay out a keyboard. But when they first created this, it made a lot of sense. We had these mechanical keys, and if you type too fast, you would jam up your keyboard, they would end up breaking. So they designed this QWERTY keyboard layout to make it as slow and inefficient as possible. But now we use electric keypads. I have this ridiculous Apple laptop with these tiny keys that don't work. And we're stuck with this solution that no longer makes sense. And in the same way, when we proposed this energy system training model, it made sense with what we could measure. But now we could measure all of these different things. And they've never really gone back and updated this in textbooks. And most people still don't know that this exists. Another example, we have this picture on the right here. And this is from McNulley et al.'s paper titled Simultaneous In Vivo Measurements of HBO2 Saturation and PCR Kinetics After Exercise in Normal Humans. And what this paper basically showed is that phosphocreatine, which we supposedly don't use past 10 seconds during all-out exercise, and oxygen, which, apparent, which they say doesn't become a dominant fuel source till after two minutes, these things fly together. So if we're doing an all-out sprint, PCR and oxygen are going down at the same rate. If we're resting and recovering, they're going up at the same rate. And these things are so tightly coupled to one another that this chart on the left just doesn't really make sense anymore. So this leads us to what I'll refer to as more of a contemporary model of bioenergetics, which we'll touch on the next slide, and then we'll get into some more practical stuff. If only I could figure out how to use my new laptop. So this is the new paradigm of bioenergetics. In this chart, you see we still have the phosphagen, glycolytic, and oxidative pathways. But you can see that all of them are overlapping at all times in this model. And instead of that time frame being from seconds to minutes to hours, it's 0 to 100 milliseconds. So if we quickly get into some of the minutia of this model versus that like old kind of wacky fragmented model, what we see in the literature is that the support of muscle contraction requires really rapid non-oxidative, so what we would typically call anaerobic, um, ATP or energy production on the millisecond time scale. So within about 0 to 15 milliseconds when we start contracting a muscle, phosphocreatine is broken down to restore ATP. And that's not all that different from that old model, except that it's occurring on a much faster time scale. Instead of 0 seconds to 10 seconds, we're talking 0 to 15 milliseconds. But what happens next is where things start to get kind of interesting and break that old model. So in order to sustain those contractions, we need a non-oxidative energy supply. But the issue is that the amount of glucose that we actually store in a muscle is really limited. So one of the things that we see in the biochemical evidence is that glycogen phosphorylase, which breaks apart muscle glycogen, could really rapidly increase its activity. And as a result, we could break down muscle glycogen to restore phosphocreatine to sustain contractions. So that's kind of different from that old model. And then the question then becomes, like, how do we maintain glycogen stores in the muscle? Because if we're quickly breaking those down, you either have to eat like 80 bagels a minute to keep repleting that, or our body has to do it naturally. So between those contractions, the ATP needed to resynthesize glycogen and PCR and reestablish all these ion gradients is going to come from oxidizing lactate, so breaking down lactate through aerobic processes.
And because that process is so inefficient, only a fraction of the lactate that we produced is actually needed to um, replenish those ATP stores. So we see lactate accumulating in muscles. So this is important for a few reasons. One is that oxygen is always present in the muscle, so all training is aerobic. And I know this kind of sounds really pedantic, like, oh, oxygen's always present, like all training's aerobic, lactate's always present, all training is lactic, but it is important because you hear people talk about when you do like high effort sprinting, I'm doing anaerobic alactic training. And it's like, well, how does that work? If you're doing anaerobic alactic, that means no oxygen, no lactate. But if we always have oxygen and lactate in the muscle, it's like, what the hell are you actually doing? The model doesn't make sense and the foundations are kind of degraded. So it leads to these concepts that are kind of wacky. So next thing we see, lactate is also always present in the muscle, so all training is lactic. And this one is kind of confusing to people because contrary to popular belief, lactate isn't a fatigue byproduct. It's a fuel source for um, oxidation or replenishing ATP stores. And even as early as like the 1970s, George Brooks was talking about this and everyone thought he was insane. Like people fully dismissed his work and it wasn't until about 20 years ago that his beliefs started to really become vindicated. And we see, oh, lactate isn't this poison or this fatigue metabolite. And the last thing we see in this model is that oxygen and phosphocreatine systems, these things are completely entangled with one another. So if oxygen's going up, phosphocreatine's going up. If oxygen's going down, phosphocreatine's going down. This is really contradictory to that traditional energy system training model. So why are these things important? Like why, does, why do we actually need to know these things? One, this model confirms that all of these energetic processes overlap in time. That time frame is milliseconds versus seconds, so it occurs way faster than people classically believed. The next is that there's no contradictions with the observed SMO2 trends, um, This, like you would see in that contemporary model. And in the picture here, we see um, an athlete doing a sprint and we're measuring muscle oxygen saturation. As soon as they start the sprint, oxygen's going down in the muscle. As soon as they stop, oxygen comes back up. So we see oxygen utilization responds immediately to load, and that's a really key point. And then the next thing is there's no anaerobic system. When oxygen hits 0% and we are anaerobic, you're pretty much fucked. Like performance is gonna stall out, period. That's where you see someone running and it looks like they're trying to like bite their ear because their head's flailing all over the place. So that's not something that we could rely on. And what makes this interesting is well, if there's no anaerobic system, like what def differentiates a sprinter from a marathoner? It's not that a sprinter is an anaerobic athlete and a marathoner is an aerobic athlete. These things aren't fundamentally different in type. The only thing that differentiates them is the rate of oxygen utilization. So the way that we could think of a sprinter, they're kind of like a drag racer. They have this big supply of oxygen in the muscle and say their event is 20, 30 seconds. They could just go all out and dump that entire tank of oxygen and utilize everything they have in the muscle and bottom it out to a low level. Where if you take a marathoner, they're kind of like uh, maybe like a Prius. They also have this big oxygen tank, but they could extend it across their event. And when they finish an event, they're not gonna have completely exhausted oxygen stores in the muscle. And if that sprinter is a drag racer and a marathoner is a Prius and a CrossFit athlete's kind of like a Tesla, they have a pretty big tank, they're pretty enduring, they're pretty fast but they don't completely bottom out their oxygen stores and they also don't finish an event with a ton of oxygen in their muscle. So if we understand this science, we could start to pick apart statements like these. So the statement that we have on this um, chart, and this is from an energy system training course is, as a rule of thumb, the closer the event's duration is to one minute, the lower the aerobic contribution to overall performance will be. The opposite is also true. The longer the duration, the more dominant the aerobic system will be. Like, man, if someone's teaching this and they have that much confidence in it, like, how could you truly say this if all the scientific evidence points in the other direction? If I pop a moxie monitor on you and I have you just sprint as hard as you can until you throw up on yourself in 30 seconds, we're gonna see oxygen completely bottom out in the muscle. So statements like this, you could clearly call bullshit because we could observe these things in the gym. Like we're not talking about these theoretical models. We're talking about things that we could easily watch happening. And we also get to this point, like shaky scientific foundations lead to shaky concept models. So we have this chart here and it's a standard energy system trainings chart that people use. We have a lactic power from one to six seconds a lactic capacity from seven to eight seconds. Well, 
How is it alactic if we already have uh, lactate circulating in well oxygenated tissue? How is it anaerobic if we have oxygen in the muscle? It says this is an oxygen dependent process. Then we have lactic acid power and capacity. Lactic acid can't form under physiologic conditions in the body. So one that's not even a real molecule that exists in the body, it would be lactate. And again, it's kind of like pedantic to get into this, but it is important because um, it's very practical. Like we don't get into all this science for its own sake. If we understand bioenergetics, we could come up with accurate concept models that drive meaningful performance outcomes. But when we don't understand bioenergetics, we come up with charts like these, things like the MAP models of energy system training. And these things start to fall apart because they don't really make sense in light of everything that we know about physiology. So last thing that I want to get into is cyclical versus mixed energy system training demands. So this week in the Training Think Tank classroom, I'm going to discuss all of the practical applications of this concept model and how using it allows us to move away from these standard zone-based training models and instead move towards something that is physiologically accurate, more practical, and easy to use with athletes, and just simply more effective. Um, and this is the way that we've been training a lot of our competitors for the past few years. I'm also going to discuss the difference between cyclical and mixed energy system training demands and why you can't just take these um, standard endurance training models and just layer in mixed movements. Some of the considerations with that include the alternation of involved and non-involved muscle groups and the challenge that that imposes on our blood pressure regulation. We'll also talk about bracing and intra-abdominal pressures impact on blood pressure and blood flow to all of the extremity muscles and why CrossFit and cyclical work look fundamentally different inside of a muscle and how the best CrossFit athletes could turn CrossFit into cyclical work. So here we have a nearest trend from a CrossFit Games competitor. And a few years back, um, we had a CrossFit Games athlete training camp. And me and Max were watching Travis do a Metcon on the floor and Max had made some offhand comment like, oh, you watch Travis and he turns Metcons into cyclical work. And Max didn't mean anything like super profound by that. He was literally just saying like, oh, if you've ever seen Travis do an open workout, he just doesn't stop moving the entire time. But once we started using NEARS, we literally saw, oh, CrossFit Games athletes, the best ones do turn mixed work into cyclical work. If you look inside the, their muscle and you watch the blood flow and oxygen trends, it mimics it perfectly. So this is a NEARS trend on the bottom of one of our Games athletes. And you see this nice linear rate of oxygen desaturation in the muscle where you watch even like bubble level games athletes or sanctional athletes, and some of them you watch them do CrossFit and you look at their muscle physiology. Like it basically looks like they're doing circuit training on machines in a commercial gym. So before we wrap up, I'll quickly show you a sneak peek of some of the other topics we'll cover in the classroom this week. So we'll go over TTT's entire energy system training model running from the spectrum of oxygen delivery to oxygen utilization. So moving away from these kind of fragmented zone based models. Um, we'll go into how to assess your physiological limitations. First, I'll explain the theory and foundations of how we use this with sports science technology. Then we'll get into how to do this without requiring any technology, and this is a test that anyone can do. So if you're interested in learning about these topics, um, we'll see you in the classroom. Learn more about the art and science of program design for CrossFit in our online educational platform, The Classroom. Get a free seven-day trial at trainingthinktank.com backslash classroom trial.